Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, because I'm very short, even though I'm on this like humongous hair, I'm gonna stand here. <laughs> so I get to see all of you. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Hi. Uh, it's it's really a lot of pressure when keep people saying, "Oh, we are going to hear from somebody so rational and logical, someone like Ayan Hershey Ali, and then Yummy Park." <laughs> And I'm like, that's not me. And so lower your expectations. <laughs> the only reason why I'm standing here today is because I'm very good at catching uh, grasshoppers. <laughs> I was not that good at, dra at catching dragonflies, but I was excellent hand with the uh, grasshoppers. And that helped me to survive North Korea. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> so. How many of you actually saw my speech or read my book? Wow. So who hasn't never ever heard about me or any of my story before? OK, so we do half and half. <laughs> I know we have a Q&A after this. So I would love to give more time to the people who have questions. And so to start off, um, as you heard, I'm from North Korea. I am now 28 years old. I was born in a country that didn't even have the map for the world. We don't even know what internet is. We don't even have electricity. And one thing that is so unique about North Korea is that we are not naturally poor. Um, this is where I became the defender of freedom and individual liberty is. Uh, if you look at North Korea and South Korea, we share the exact same history, we speak the same language, we have same genetics, and we have same tradition. And now one country, that is South Korea, the country of K-pop and Samsung, right? So much innovation and democracy. And the other side of North Korea, that is people are starving and they are so remote, so isolated that we might be able to go to the moon and Mars before we ever go to North Korea. And this is all because of the one family that was Kim, Kim family, they decide that they want to be a god in 21st century. So growing up in North Korea, I had no idea the world like, existed, like this existed. I had zero clue. And at school, all day long, I learned how horrible American bastards were. <laughs> so it's so surreal for me that I'm surrounded with this many bastards. <laughs> and they love me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I guess that's why miracle is possible. Uh, all day long at school, I learned uh, how horrible the enemies were, how American bastards were like cold blooded, like reptile, almost like snake monsters who was trying to attack us all day long. And how grateful we were that we were, had our dear leader, the Kim Jong-il, who was like a god, came out the mountains. He knows what I'm even thinking in my head. And we were the luckiest people on this earth to be living in a socialist paradise. And I know I will go into my story, but I really wanted to, to touch on the, how North Korea began. And it, it's in some ways that like, I'm reliving that past by being in America. North Korea began in the idea, not in the idea of like poverty and all these horrible things, but they began the idea of equality of outcomes how everybody, we all should be equal. So in the, after the World War II ended, in Korea, they were landowners and the peasants. And then Kim Il-sung came, he was a Marxist, and promised to people that if you give us your land, right, and if you give us your sum of freedom and freedom of speech, we are going to take the, all this land from the landowners and the business people, and we are going to div divide them equally to everybody. So there's nobody who's poor or richer than anybody. We are going to be living in a happy paradise that is perfectly equal. Nobody suffers. Nobody's better off than anybody. And my people, 
my grandmother. They genuinely wanted this. They gave their land. So the regime abolished private property. Nobody in North Korea can, can own anything. You cannot own your house. You cannot own your car. You cannot own even your body. And then, and they said eventually what they did with that equality of dream, they made North Koreans into 51 different classes among the same people. We are not like America, there's a lot of diversity of race. We are the same Korean homogeneous country and they divided us into 51 different classes. And this system is so evil because if you, there's a, two lovers meet each other, right? And you love this girl so much. But if your family status is higher than her, if you marry her, that means in North Korea, you don't marry up, you only go down. That's how they prevent the mix of class. So the, if you ever take the chance of marrying somebody from lower class, not only you go down, but you are bringing down three generations of your family go down to that low class. So nobody insane in the family gonna support that marriage. And that's how they could survive this long. So growing in that country, never seen the map of the world, and I had no idea that I was even Asian because at school, the, they taught me that I was my dear leader's race, Kim Il-sung's race. And Kim Il-sung, who was, grew up in a Christian family, and he one day got a brilliant idea. So, you know, whenever there's a communist revolution happens, they go after religion because the government want to become a god instead. So what they did is they killed all the Christians. They killed all the Buddhists and other religious people. And then he copied the exact same Bible principle. So this is where it comes down to. A lot of people say, why like, do North Koreans, are they so dumb? Why do they believe this propaganda? It's because Kim Il-sung copied the Bible said, I love you guys so much. I was chosen by the universe. I'm giving you my son, Kim Jong-il, like Jesus Christ. And his body dies like Jesus did, but his spirit is with us forever. And therefore, he knows what we think and how much hair in our head. And that's how they control your, what you think. And that's how they make you even afraid to think being in that country. So, and then, of course, the Ten Commandments that Bible has, and they copy their version of the thing. So because basically, Kim regime became a god, and they, they brainwashed us to believe that they are gods. So when I came out, like... I couldn't believe when people were telling me that Kim Jong-un actually poops. <laughs> he goes to the bathroom. And <laughs> yesterday I was like uh, hearing about all these intellectuals and I was thinking about today's speech. I was like, I mean, I was literally somebody thought the most handsome guy was Kim Jong-il Kim Jong when I was in North Korea. <laughs> That's how ignorant. I was, how brainwashed I was, and what I'm going to talk about today here. And so that, like, complete control the information and isolation and division between people. And this is also why I really decided to speak out today, especially in this time of America. It's, it breaks my heart. It, there's a, when people are being divided and not trusting each other, you know who wins? People in control, people in government. North Korean regime did this such a good job. Like they, if there's three people here, then we are spying on somebody and somebody spying on me. But that person also being spied by somebody. So even if I'm gonna be a, such a nice person that I'm not gonna report on my neighbor, that I know is somebody spying on me. That person decided not to spy on me, but that person also being watched. So you cannot escape this cycle of spying on somebody and you have to report on other people. That destroys trust between your neighbors, your friends, and your family members. And that's why that trust between people is very important. So after all this brainwashing, it got, came down to one moment that was just as simple as that. It was basic survivor. I was 13 years old and I was living in a border town. It was 2007. And I 
just couldn't survive. There was no food. There's nothing we could do to find food. And luckily, I was living in the border town of North Korea, and I saw the lights coming from China. And that's when I got the hint. If I go where the lights were, I could find a bowl of rice. So when I escaped in North Korea, it's so funny because I did not even know what free freedom was. I was just simply risking my life for a bowl of rice. Once I went to China at 13, I realized there was a state sponsored by modern slavery by Chinese communist regime. They sell North Korean girls for sex slaves. And because uh, China had one child policy, there are millions of men cannot find women. There's a shortage of women who can marry these men. So they buy North Korean girls. And this is like, life is so bizarre. Uh, I think two years ago during the pandemic, the lockdown, I got so lonely living in Chicago. So one day I drove to a pet store that my friend suggested. And she said these puppies were treated so nice by a breeder and it's ethical to get these puppies. So I was, I got this puppy that was $7,000. <laughs> it's a very expensive puppy the size of my like a uh, feast or something. And I was thinking, I was like less than $300 when I was sold. Literally the same lifetime. And, and then, of course, during the looting and BLM living in America, these people believe they are the most oppressed people in the world that ever existed. <laughs> and like, how do I ever even tell these people that slavery even never ended? And there are people continuously being oppressed. So in China at 13, I was a sex slave for two years. I was separate from all my, mother, all my family. And my mother, who was around 40 years old, she was sold for around $65. Uh, two years later, miraculously, I met a missionary from South Korea. And they finally told me about real God and just Christ. And they told me there was a way out of that uh, slavery, which was crossing the Gobi Desert, frozen Gobi Desert into Mongolia. And if we were lucky that we survived in the desert and go to Mongolia, I mean, Mongolia, then we might be able to rescue to South Korea. And that was when I was uh, 15 years old in 2009. So I did go on, on that journey crossing the desert. And luckily I survived and I arrived in South Korea. And most of people would think like, that's an amazing story. The, happy ending, isn't it? It's like I've, I finally found my freedom and became a free human and became a new human being almost. But that wasn't because I decided to speak out against the regime. I wanted to tell the world how horrible the Chinese communist regime is running this dictatorship in North Korea and how my fellow North Korean defectors, hundreds of thousands of them, do you know how many North Koreans right now have arrived in, in America over the last 80 years? 207. And <laughs> American government still don't want North Korean defectors coming here. So, like I had a burden, like it's not something I did that was special, I made it because somebody helped me to get here. And I wanted to help is 300,000 North Korean women right now. They are sometimes toddlers sold for sex toys. Their organs being harvested out of them. 300,000 of modern slaves in China. And we buy the puppies for seven grand. Our problem here is having too much food. Our problem is obesity. I could understand it, like my people's problem is not having food and somehow our problem is having too much food. We can fix this. And I decided to speak out and I realized 
the world those did not want to do anything about North Korea because they did not want to upset China. And I started getting censored on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram. I get censored, uh, what is that thing? They hide my account. And then my videos that I made get canceled. So I reached out to Google one day. And I texted them like on the email, like, do you not support Me Too or something? <laughs> right? It was all the time of era of Me Too. Like these women are being raped by Communist Party. And you don't want me to talk about this. And it's like, it doesn't meet our requirements and guidelines. And that disillusioned the country that we are living in right now, that America that I thought. This was the land of the free and the home of the brave. And there's uh, so much lies, so much manipulation by media and lies. And also, in some ways, witnessing a national suicide. I went to university in New York studying uh, at Columbia University. And I talked about American bastards, right? <laughs> I couldn't believe if that was a North Korean classroom or like American classroom. Literally, these highly educated, like Nobel lottery professors, they say the, all the problems that we have in America and in the world is because of white men, their original sin. And the people now being penalized. I have a son who is a half white and who is a half North Korean. And they say, my son is privileged and he's guilty for the ancestor's crime. And that's what exactly North Korean regime does. I was born in a low ranking of the class because supposedly my great-great-grandfather owned a tiny bit of land in his yard. So he was a landowner. Therefore, my blood was tainted forever. And now we are doing exact same tactic that North Korean regime uses to divide people and never embrace the humanity that we are and move on with each other and making things better. So now I'm the enemy of the walk as well as enemy of Kim Jong-un. <laughs> so I have plenty of enemies, but I am hopeful because still in America, we still have a bit of time. We still can speak. And if not in North Korea, what I did just now, they would execute me, right? And that's the thing, there's always room for gratitude and for find the hope. So I'm so grateful that you came here to hear my story and fight for this amazing nation that we have. So thank you so much, everyone. Q&A, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thanks, thanks for being here. It's uh, your true inspiration, I think, to many out in the world uh, who see a lot of darkness and looking for someone to share a light in terms of stories. Um, so my question would be, um, so I come from Germany. My entire family uh, comes from Eastern Germany, so suffered also from a communist regime for like 40, 50 years. And when I try to compare what I read and hear from North Korea to former East Germany, then it seems there's a lot of parallels, but it's just like a really light, light, light version. So the intensity is like significantly stronger in North Korea than in Eastern Germany, but there's a lot of parallels. So my questions or questions to you would be, um, in the future, talking of a united Korea, um, like when could that happen in terms of a time window, like North and South Korea uniting, same as East and West Germany did? Um, second, um, how would that look like in your opinion? And third, more of a, a personal note, um, if you could pick whatever position you can be in, how would you like to contribute to when that event happens or where would you see yourself in that role? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know Germany is always an inspiration for the Korean people whose brothers and sisters got separated, right? Uh, but like you said, uh, during the Germany when they were separated, the economic difference was only three to four times difference. But North Korea and South Korea difference is more than different times. So that gap is so huge economically. And 
And not only that, actually even physically, the Koreans evolved differently. Because in the North, we have this severe malnutrition. So North Koreans are on average three to five inches taller than the uh, South Koreans. And the language evolved. So it's, this is like where, if you read the George Orwell's 1984, it talks about the double speak. Why, even in America right now, they are so obsessed with the controlling language. Because if you control what you say, you can control what you think. So in North Korea, they remove the words like love. So people don't even know what's love between the human beings. The only love that we allow to know is our love towards the dear leader and the mother party. And there's no word I. So we don't know what, uh, what individual means. We don't even know what I mean. We always use we. And of course, there's no word for human rights and liberty. And then, of course, like people like pizza, McDonald's, right? <laughs> it's, that's like secondary thing. So language evolved, physically different. And in the North, the history was forgotten. They get, got erased. We learned the history from the time when Kim Il-sung was born. The North Korean calendar begins when Kim Il-sung was born. They don't teach us anything about the time before Kim's. So it'll be a lot harder. <laughs> and my hope is that North Korea somehow, maybe even copying the Chinese model, initially open up the economy, feed the people, and gradually accepting these ideas. But <laughs> it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Yunmi. I just want to say, first of all, it's an honor to be here listening to you. Uh, you started off, uh, you know, kind of undercutting yourself. Don't do that. You have a really powerful story, very inspirational, and uh, you're a huge voice. So Thank you. my question is, um, is there anything that we can do as Americans to help free the North Koreans from the North Korean people from the North Korean regime and other places like, you know, in Venezuela, uh, what can we do today to help kind of, I guess, uh, free those people that are oppressed in the world? Thank you for that question. Um, that would have been an excellent question. Like five years ago, before I moved to America, but well, you might be losing your country too. So <laughs> I don't think it's time for Americans to <laughs> even leverage that much. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, in America now, I'm fighting for my freedom of speech. That basic right that we are given, that is, we are losing it here. So if we, I'm reading this book right now, uh, America, the world without America, what it would look like. And it's being America what it is. I think people don't understand who are born here, how unique it is. How can you start a country upon an idea, like the ideas, right? It's like usually the country start by like kings and all those things, but this country is so unique, and this country was made to give power to individuals. And that is something unheard of. So we would need to protect this country first for humanity's sake. Then if we want to really do want to help North Korea, it was what Trump said. That was the only way we can change North Korea is through China. If China does not supply this oil and natural resources, North Korea cannot build the nukes. They cannot even survive one week without China. So all that it comes down to China respects the international law and do not sponsor the dictatorship, then we can end the dictatorship. But nobody in the world right now standing up against China and challenge the regime. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Naomi, big fan. Um, so your journey from North Korea to America is pretty incredible. Um, and I was just wondering at what point in that did you feel the most sense of relief? Like was it when you finally escaped North Korea? Was it when you made it to South Korea? Was it when you made it to America? 
Um, yeah, I guess at, at what point did you feel the biggest like ah, that you were relieved? And also, if I get a picture with you, that'd be amazing. Uh, of course. <laughs> oh, it, it physically, I'm still not very safe, right? Uh, I mean, living in Chicago downtown, <laughs> besides Kim Jong Un's threat, like I'm really not safe. <laughs> but, but I think sense of relief comes from, I guess, you know, like get in touch with my creator, like whatever you call. Her. So that gives me a lot of <laughs> Yeah, thank you. You hear me? Uh, so I think the fact that you're, I think one of the only speakers that's here with like, uh, you walked in with two guards is very concerning. And so for the people who are wanting to defund the police, that's just very sad. Uh, the fact that you are, you need guards to be in here. I come from a country where that's the norm as well. Uh, so two questions. Uh, we have Pride Month. For an entire month, we're holding flags, but we don't have a month for America. And so why would you tell someone who has never been outside of the U.S. but thinks the U.S. is not worth, or the U.S. flag is worth respecting, yeah. number one. Number two, I really want to hear your thoughts on Joe Biden. <laughs> For those people who doesn't think that America is worth defending, well, they should just immigrate to North Korea. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's it's amazing all these people hate America with their, their guts but they stay so annoying. <laughs> there why there are people like North Koreans risking their life to come here and they still don't get to come because they don't accept them. With, with the current president it's a I was actually was so brainwashed by the liberals in New York too, you know. I came to America and I couldn't possibly fathom there. There is a propaganda and lying media manipulation happening in America. Like I was so innocent, and after living here so long, it's just now it's like, well, we are a bit more sophisticated North Korean version right now, <laughs> and of course the consequences of disagreeing with the mainstream idea, political correctness is not as bad, but we are in a definitely that trajectory that you. I mean, they call me I'm a Nazi, that I'm a white passing person who does not know what oppression is. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, but the thing is, I just hope that's a minority there because I was living in Manhattan and Chicago and hopefully the majority of Americans are more, much more reasonable than that. And I think that's the hope. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi. Uh I was not aware that you were a mother, but um, so that's my question relates to that. You know, in America today, how do you prevent your, um, you said son, your son from being converted into a leftist or something that you would not um, appreciate <laughs> as much? I will move the state or move the country. I think it there right there's a lot of studies now shows people even in in California there's a rates of children becoming transgender is a lot higher than other states. I I my, my son right now is going to a daycare in Chicago and he's four. Already his school sends me these emails how they are doing a wonderful job teaching him about equity. I did all that to escape communism and they are really, like raising my son like a little commie right now. <laughs> so, but I still think it's up to parents and up to an individual to resist. So I will do everything I, I can, if, even if that means me moving a country that <laughs> I'm loving America so much, but I have to move out so he does not become into that group think. And there's something so horrible. Think about what communism did, how much millions of people died because of that, right? So because of that, it's my responsibility to take him from it and protect him and until he develops his critical thinking skill. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, hello, um, thank you for the amazing talk. So I would like to ask about um, extradition. So I have watched extradition. So I have watched you amongst other ex-North Korean influencers, and a lot of and a lot of time I hear that, for example, you face like so like you you would be constantly afraid of being sent back to North Korea if you are in China. But if you're in somewhere like, I don't know, Thailand, you wouldn't face that fear. Right, so, um, yeah, so um, I come from communist China, like not come from, I was born in communist China. I grew up in Hong Kong to see Hong Kong fall and to see, you know, the national sec security law being established. And while most of the West wouldn't send extradition agreements, so wouldn't send people to North Korea, a lot of a lot of the West, a lot of the liberal West, would be more than willing to sign agreements and send people back to uh, and send what the Chinese government deem as criminals to China to face persecution. So um. And God knows, like maybe they will send you to, ch to, to China and then from there send you to North Korea. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? Because, I th because like personally, I don't think it is, a, it is not a very optimistic situation dealing like um, to do with China because of just the scale that it is. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a, I have a lot of sympathy and I love Hong Kong and the people so brave there. And did not know quite that America do send this distance from Hong Kong back to their country. Um, so, the, so the national security law, which was always in China and recently got established in Hong Kong, was that if you break Chinese law, whatever nationality you are and wherever you break Chinese law, so you could be an American, like, like um, speaking or, you know, speaking against the Chinese government in America. And if you step into any countries that has an extradition agreement with China, then they would be able to send you to China and face, um, um, make you face persecution. So you might disappear. And wow, that's... That's shocking. I I can also believe that because everybody wants. I mean, Hollywood, for instance. Uh, I've been trying. To, there are people like trying to make a movie about my story, and one of the producers were trying to make a movie about my story. And then, in the script, they said uh, China was a promised land, and how they were protecting me. I was not a sex slave there. And I asked him, like, why would you write us like a, a script that is completely lie? And he's like, there's no way, no wow. studio to pick up that movie if you use bad mouth China. And that's in the states. In, in, and in Hollywood right now. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's why wow. they don't make anything movies about. There's a tons of movie, movie about Holocaust. Why do they not make anything about North Korean human rights issue? Because then they have to expose China and. There is so much funding coming from China. No studio would touch that script and that project. Unbelievable. Thank you for telling us that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, China. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um just wanted to say thank you for showing how much you love life. It's truly remarkable. Um, you, you, you show the world that you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, my question is, uh, where do you see yourself in 10 years? What would you like to achieve by then? Thank you. Uh, in 10 years, I would love to be grateful. <laughs> Not going to therapy like my friends are. <laughs> it's... It, I really sympathize a lot with uh, why people are not happy in America is because really they don't really have an actual problem and that's a problem. So they have to keep making problems. <laughs> Thank you, but it is true. Most of my days now I'm dealing with very stupid problems like, weather is so cold. Why the winter is so brutal? Why 
uh, heating, central heating, warm shower, food, refrigerator. I'm complaining about Chicago cold all day long. <laughs> like, you get adjust to those things. Yeah. And it's so easy to lose that perspective. So I think no matter, of course, my mission is bringing, making more people free and give them voice. But besides that, I try to not lose that perspective. So we can be grateful for what we have. I think that's the, my very important thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my heart is beating so fast right now. <laughs> So, uh, Ms. Park, uh, first I want to thank you for sharing that part of your life. Um, I want to share a little bit with you. My name is Cesar. And even though it says Washington, D.C., I'm from Maracaibo, Venezuela. And uh, that makes me feel a lot of connection with you because a lot of things that you say, even though they haven't happened exactly as you say, they're somehow happening in Venezuela as well. So, I believe that gives me the right to ask you this question. Um, we know that elections are not going to work. We know that international community is not going to do much as well. And it's really hard to have a civil war in your country. So what do you think it's going to take for the, Korean, the, the people in North Korea to finally find a solution to this whole problem, which is not only on a government level, but it's in a multi-dimensional level, society, economy, et cetera. So I know you said deep question, but if you, if you can find a way to answer that question, to see if you can give me some light and see if I can also change my country as I know that you want to do it. So, Gamsamida. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's a very deep question. Uh, it's, North Korea is a very unique scenario because I met a lot of people from Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, and very oppressed regimes there too. But people in those countries, they know that the regime is screwed that people are oppressed. But something that is so unique about North Korea is that regime so completely isolate them that people don't even know they're oppressed. They don't even know they're enslaved by the regime. And if you don't know you're a slave, how can you be, like, try to fight, be free? That's an impossible task. So for the North Korean people, that's very hard because they don't know they're oppressed and they don't know life can be like this. So the first step is somehow we need to wake their minds and show them the real world and get them out of their brainwashing. Then I think we can discuss other steps, but North Korea is such a primitive state right now. <laughs> they don't even know the word for freedom, so they, there's no way they can be on the street someday fighting for freedom. Because they, at school, we don't even learn what revolution is. They don't teach us that. And this is something about why I really appreciate people are interested in knowledge and truth. It's, it's not innate to humanity when you are born, like we knew that slavery was bad, right? That's why the enlightenment was important. If we are born, if we don't have education, we don't know. Like I might thought like Kim Jong-il was a handsome guy. <laughs> I did not know that Brad Pitt was hot. <laughs> so, <laughs> We need to learn the truth, and that's why we need to keep coming to these places and keep awakening our minds and sharpen our thoughts. Thank you very much, and you yeah. deserve all the runs of apostles in the world. Honestly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh. Hi. From your time in America, certainly you've been experiencing American culture. I'd be interested to know what has given you the most pause experiencing American culture, something from it. The most surprise. Where do I begin? <laughs> American culture is very unique, and I like every culture is. It's also you cannot generalize America. It's a very different factions and different state. Uh, the biggest pause for me is when, like. Uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting at Columbia, like the facts doesn't matter, but how you feel matters the most, right? Like uh, the trigger warnings and how you feel really the most important thing. So if in classroom, uh, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, then you don't even need to do the assignment. You don't even need to come to the class. 
and these are the college graduates gonna be in this country right now at Columbia Ivy League School. Literally, professors were sending us emails before the class. All this might have trigger warnings for the race intro struggle war, maybe like PTSD. Don't do the reading. Don't come to read the class. You don't even need to tell me why it bothers you and give us those trigger warnings. Then I'm like, why are you in university then? <laughs> and I imagine they were this bubble wrapped, never exposed to any reality. When they graduate, they go to become the executives and be the people in the society. What kind of world are they going to create? Exactly what country that we are seeing right now that's so far from the reality and there's no more truth anymore. So hard to know what truth is and that's almost like living in North Korea. Hi, you're on me. Uh, I'd like to ask also, could I have a photo with you after? Uh, I should have asked yesterday, but it would be very nice, thank you. Uh, but my question is, um, oh, freedom is a requirement for human life and happiness. I think you would know that better than anybody. But people in North Korea don't have freedom, and you were very fortunate to escape. It'd be very difficult for all North Koreans to escape, only very few do. But what can they have hope on? What freedom can they find in their personal life? Or to put my question in another way, what would you have done if you were sent back to North Korea and if you failed to escape? Well, I would fight like hell to be free. <laughs> it's whatever that I went through to be free, I have no regrets. And what I am afraid of is not even losing freedom. It's, if you read the Georgia's, like the animals farm, right? Like it comes down to the generation. They don't even know what freedom is. So then if you lose that, you don't even know, you can never find the way back. And we might be losing freedom, but we might become like North so someday. Like we are not immune to that. And I think that's why we need to be like vigilant, keeping this freedom and understanding what really it means to be free. I think this is a lot of people keep asking me like, how do you define freedom? And I was like, you lived in freedom for all your life. You're asking a North Korean to define freedom for you? <laughs> Thank you, but it's, initially I, I thought that was the most bizarre question I was keep getting in every interview that I do. They are keep asking, what does freedom mean to you? I'm like, you should tell me. <laughs> but I think that's when I understood most of people don't know what it means to be free. Freedom means self-like responsibility. It comes with discipline. It comes with virtue. It's not just jacking yourself with a heroin on the street and be do whatever you want. It comes with all other things, but somehow this country have like failed to teach the children about the principles of freedom, and now they're asking North Korean to talk about it. <laughs> so I think that is why, why we are losing freedom, because most of people don't understand what freedom is. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you support the effort to send USB flash drives into North Korea? And also, if you were choosing the content to go on those drives, and maybe also for Chinese, what content would you include? Uh, I do definitely support uh, sending this outside information into North Korea, because that was also one moment that changed my life, is uh, growing up in North Korea, as I said, Everything is a propaganda, right? There's no Romeo and Juliet. We don't know anything besides a propaganda. And when I watched this bootleg DVD, the movie about Titanic, and as a young girl, I could not believe a man can die for like a woman. A movie can made about an entirely shameful story. Like that really gave me a taste of freedom. So I think it's showing even just like that kind of innocent movie can awaken North Korean minds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, before I start fangirling, because your work is incredible and I've been following it for a while, um, all of you consistently talk about how you shifted from survival mode into living mode and like a deep understanding of what it means to be a, a sovereign individual human being 
was there a light bulb moment or was that grad a gradual shift and what was that shift like also congratulations on the new fuzzy addition to your family uh, definitely when I was reading George Orwell's book that was a new turning point because the hardest thing you go through all of that and now you're in a country like South Korea there's freedom and respect for human rights it wasn't about like like learning about you know how to eat coca-cola or hamburger or pizza it was hard but really, how do you trust again? Because when I got there, the South Korean officials told me that everything you believed in your life was a lie. And now what I'm telling you is truth. So you need to accept this truth that they literally told me that Americans are not bastards. They are great people. And the Kim, Kim Jong-un goes to the bathroom. He's a dictator. Like all these horrible things. And I was like, so if everything that I believe was a lie, how do I know what you're telling me is not a lie? Where's the evidence? You, you, you come in this like chaos mode, like I don't know how to trust anything ever again. And that's when the, those books helped me. And then started to living in a more, like uh, not surviving. I think that was more like gradual process than that. But I think that thinking, understanding what happened, was like a very important step for me to become free emotionally. Okay, so once more, I'm really grateful for your powerful message across the world. I have a question. Did you notice that since you started spreading your message, um, did you notice some cracks on pro North Korean propaganda wall? Or did you notice that this propaganda got, even if it's possible, more hateful, more harsh? Did they somehow react to your message and they started to be more careful with checking people in North Korea if they are running away or started sending some propaganda information that it's not true what you are saying or something like this? That, that was really good. Uh, initially when I spoke out, this Marxist, Maoist, Leninist, all of these guys came after me. <laughs> because in some ways, the North Korea is the last country that holding the socialist paradise flag. That's what they, they call the last country still holds that ideology as a national policy. And and they were like, she's. How do we know that she's a North Korean? Even she got to be. A, uh, I mean, they say Elon Musk is an alien. <laughs> so they say like she might not be a North Korean. She might be a CIA spy. That's why always go for. And thankfully, North Korea did a smear campaign against me that how I'm a liar, that how North Korea is a wonderful place. But in that uh, video, they published my birth certificate. And they confirmed that I was born in Heisan on this day, who my father was, and everybody was. So thankfully, that settled the argument that I was not a North Korean. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, because I spoke out, they went after three generations of my family. So they got all punished because I spoke out. And I think this is why most of people don't understand the word like when they say freedom is not free. For them, it's like, oh, it's such a cliche thing to say. Because when they're born, they got freedom for free. So they don't understand how precious freedom means how some people pay so much price to be free. Okay, thank you. Keep fingers crossed for you and your family. Thank you. Hi, thank you for sharing your incredible story. Um, given everything you've been through in your, in your journey and the incredible hardships you've faced on the way, I'm, I'm wondering how you remain optimistic about the human spirit. Honestly, tough. <laughs> it's... I have seen many worse side of humanity, but I, ho I also saw the great side of humanity, right? That's why I'm here today. So easy to focusing on the darkness. So easy to like, like point the fingers at the negativity. But, you know, there's as many great side behind it. So I think keep remembering that, like especially my introduction to sex was a rape. Seeing my mom raped right in front of me. And first man who bombed me was 
bought me as a sex slave. Every man that I saw in China <laughs> was a rapist. So it was very hard for me to trust men and not hating men. But then it comes down to I had a son. Thank God for that. <laughs> I have so much sympathy for men now. <laughs> and my father was a man. He was such a lovely man. So it's, it's you know, it's hard to, it's so easy to go to self-pity and seeing the negativity, but you can come out of that and be rational. That's why we need to study Iron Rand, I guess. <laughs> be objective. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Omni. It is actually good to see you again. And you keep actually inspiring, even after I listened to you more than 15, 20 times the uh, last seven, eight years. You keep inspiring. And I still remember the first, one of the first times you actually spoke at Delhi Asia Liberty Forum. A cute little girl with a very nice smile, with a heavy heart in the heart, a heavy weight in the heart, that actually crashed down over 250 people with full of tears. And I, re I remember you speak, you telling your story with a broken English, standing right next to Casey, who is actually doing amazing work and which is actually really, really great. My, would you mind actually sharing your story, how Casey and Freedom International actually helped you while you are in South Korea? And also, is there anything our audience can actually help to uh, support these organizations which actually doing a very, very crucial work in South Korea to help people like you to empower teaching English and giving the tools to actually share these stories to fight the regime. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's lovely to meet people who need me for that long. Um, so Casey is one of my colleagues in South Korea from America, but he teaches uh, North Korean defectors in South Korea to learn English. And I'm one of the beneficiaries of that, his uh, work. So like, if you guys want to be involved and be a volunteer teacher to North Korean defectors, you can join his organization and be the volunteer. And uh, the funny story is, so I, back then I thought Americans are all lovely, they're wonderful people. So I went to a few of those events with Alice and KC. And then they were talking about something called the libertarian, right? So I had no idea what conservative was, Democrat was, or libertarian was. So in New York, I asked one day from my friend in Manhattan, like, what's a libertarian? And he said, oh, those are a bunch of white guys. Sit down and like, find a way to not to pay taxes. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, OK, they sound like horrible people, <laughs> even though and then my English was broken, so I don't know what the, what the nuances were. So, and then my agent in New York, of course, like, they are the very mainstream agent. It's like, you don't talk to these people. They are the bigots, and you are with us. And let's talk about how horrible America is, you know, how oppressed this country is, how hard it means to be a woman, all of that. And it took many years for me to even break that pressure and groupthink in America that exists. And like, obviously you're not white, not old. <laughs> and, and reading books, uh, really, really, really what means to be a classical liberal, you know? That's I was like, well, I guess I'm a libertarian then. <laughs> I don't even have to lie about it anymore. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so keep much. fighting for freedom and keep inspiring us. Hey, thank you so much for sharing everything. I'm really grateful that, that you could be here with this audience. But I kind of want to point out that obviously this audience, you know, is very friendly to your point of view already. Yeah. You know, friendly bastards. Yeah. Um, but like, <laughs> I guarantee you everyone in this room came in already thinking, you know, communism is bad and yeah. has horrible consequences for real people. Um, but, you know, I mean, you said you, you live in downtown Chicago. I mean, I lived there until recently. And there's lots of people there who, you know, communism is bad is not a prior assumption. And they're concerned with those more uh, American problems that, that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. How do you talk to those people? And is there hope for changing their minds? I think there is a hope if we send them a summer camp in North Korea for a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of them. I, th I think most of Americans haven't left the country. 
And even if they have left, they've gone to this like resorts and nice hotel with the running water and shower. And they don't even speak the foreign languages. I mean, <laughs> it's like I speak three languages. It's a very norm for the foreign nation people speak multiple languages. In America, it's hard to find people who speak fluent in another language, right? They might speak few Mexican, like Hispanic, like Spanish, but most of the time that's it. Or like bonjour, I speak French, like what do you know? That's it. <laughs> so that's the thing. I think that worldliness is lacking. I, I, some things America need to improve. I think that's it. That Americans really haven't seen the world, they haven't gotten out that much. And they are saying things like almost like nonsensical like that. So we need to maybe come up with a program with the government exchange students like to North Korean people to America and after a month you want to stay there or going to come back. Yeah. That would be a great program to have. I would fund that program actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I have so much admiration and respect for your fortitude. Uh, um, you've touched on this a couple times but I'd love for you to expound on this a little bit more. You've talked about growing up in a culture that doesn't have a concept of I and that's such a hard thing for me to wrap my head around because there's so many things that are personal experiences. Like, I have a headache. I was sold as a slave. That's not a we thing, it's a you thing. So coming from that culture and now living in a culture where I is a very predominant concept, can you talk a little bit about the difference of like how you think about things that are personal experiences when I is not like a core concept in your worldview? Yeah, it's a... It's a very interesting thing. Uh, I, I've been just like reading about China, right? This nation went through cultural revolution, the land reforms. 60 million people died during this communist revolution under Mao. And most of those people went through this as still alive. While in China, the regime would come forcefully locking down the skirts and take their uh, those, uh, tubes out so they cannot get pregnant more than one child. And this is in their living memory. But in America, when I came here, these people went through slavery such a long time ago, but their memory is so vivid, and every life they feel that oppression. So what is the difference? I think Chinese, like in North Koreans, have the mindset where in, their, in our culture that we matter, yeah, as long as I'm in a group, I'm safe. And we all went through it together. So there's no point. But in America, the I is so important that, okay, I feel this way, I feel this way. Even though maybe a lot of you went through this, it doesn't matter, I went through it too. I think that might be explaining a little bit that, but I think it's a very unique thing. People in Cambodia went through such horrible stuff too, but most of nations in that region, they don't really complain, they don't even talk about it. They don't wanna even talk about it, they just don't wanna move on. Like, okay, we all suffer so what? Like, let's move on. Let's like build a nation. So I, I know like after once if North Korea opens up, I know there's gonna be so much generation trauma and I hope my nation to come out of with gratitude and stronger and not being destroyed by their past. So it's a lot to understand there. <laughs> Okay, the last question. <laughs> uh, your, your journey to freedom is something you should very much be proud of. Um, and I find it distressing to hear that uh, people have tried to make you feel ashamed of that. Uh, because uh, as many people I think in this audience would tell you that uh, genuine, earned, warranted pride is virtuous. And so you have, you have something to be proud of. My question for you is, uh, as someone who has spoken out on things where the stakes are very, very high, uh, for anyone here who is struggling to speak their minds on something probably far, far less uh, high stakes, what would you say to them in terms of bu building up that confidence, I guess? That's, it's a... Uh... Thank you for uh, your compliments, and but it's that's the thing. Um, it's it's so easy to judge people, right? Judge the founding fathers. How could they have possibly be your slave owners? And when I think about America, the founding fathers across that ocean with all that hardship came here. 
there was so much difficulty building this nation. And because they built it, that I am the beneficiary of that, their effort. And so many people say, like, oh, if the, during the Holocaust, if I were born, I would have been the first person to denounce Nazi Germany and save those Jews. Now there are no screening factors going through the Holocaust. They are not doing anything about it. So it's, I think in some ways, when you are putting this actual test, it really shows our character. Is that all what we're saying, or this is actually we can take an action into? I know that I, I wrote actually a second book about the American wokeness and the threat of socialism in America, and I had to move out of my agent, who was the like CIA and I seemed the best agent in the world. And like people thought like, I was crazy. Why would you do that? But I think it shows that even if you lose your job, so what? You can't, you're not gonna starve. You know, I think that's what we need to, in America. It's like a lot of people think, oh, it's like me coming out and speaking out, what is wrong with the society, not gonna make a difference, but that will make a difference. So I hope that you do that at your workplace. If you're, you have to agree with that sensitive training and things that you have to go through in the corporate world or like I believe education, we need to make that commitment to shine the light. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that, and I invite you to join us for Level Up 2023 in Phoenix, Arizona, June 21 through 24. Speakers include Barry Weiss, Timothy Sandifer, Eric Daniels, and many more Voices of Reason. For information and to register, visit levelupconferences.org or click the link below. See you in Phoenix.